In 390 BCE, the Gallic tribes of northern Italy launched a devastating attack on Rome, burning and sacking the city. This event marked the beginning of a series of clashes between the Gauls and the resurgent Roman Republic. Rome, seeking revenge and to secure its expanding territories, initiated a war against the Gauls. In 284 BCE, the Romans achieved a significant victory over the Senans, one of the Gallic tribes, completely devastating their lands in modern-day Emilia-Romagna. However, the boy, a powerful Gallic tribe living north of the Senans, saw an opportunity to strike back and invaded the Roman heartland. Although the boy initially posed a threat, they ultimately suffered defeats and were forced to agree to a peace treaty with Rome in 282 BCE. Following the conflict, a period of 50 years passed before the Senans' lands had sufficiently recovered for Roman citizens to settle there. During this time, the Romans established the colony of Sena Galatia along the coast, causing concern among the boy. The boy feared that the Roman expansion would continue into Gallia Cisalpina, the region of Gaul situated south of the Alps. A new generation of boy had emerged, characterized by their youthful enthusiasm, lack of reflection, and absence of experience in enduring hardship and danger, as described by the historian Polybius. Motivated by their desire to renew the war with Rome, the boy sought assistance from Gallic tribes north of the Alps, known as Gallic Transalpina. However, their initial attempt to seek support resulted in a quarrel that led to the death of two Transalpina kings. Despite this setback, the boy found willing allies in the powerful Insubras, another Gallic tribe situated in northwestern Italy. The boy and Insubras, recognizing the need for external reinforcement, dispatched ambassadors across the Alps once again. This time, they approached the Giseti, a tribe dwelling near the Rhone River, seeking their aid in the upcoming conflict against Rome. The boy and Insubras enticed the Giseti kings Concolatanus and Anarestus with tales of Gallic bravery and presented them with gifts of gold, offering a glimpse of the potential spoils to be obtained from the Romans. Polybius, a Greek historian, described the Giseti as a formidable force, noting that never before had such a large and distinguished army been dispatched from that region of Gaul. The Giseti were renowned for their warlike nature and martial prowess, making them an attractive ally for the boy and Insubras in their endeavor to confront Rome once again. By the gods, I have always wanted to kill Romans. Ever since I was a small boy and my father told me tales of their deeds. This is a worthy enemy, Lance. Today, we will be bathed in glory. In 225 BCE, the Giseti, along with a contingent of Taurisi from the southern slopes of the Alps, crossed the Alps to join their allies on the Per River Plain. These allies now included the boy, Insubras, and other Gallic tribes who were determined to confront Rome once again. However, not all the tribes in Gallia Cisalpina shared the same desire for war with Rome. The pro-Roman tribes, such as the Veneti and Cenomani, posed a threat to the lands of the Gallic tribes preparing to march against Rome. The Boy Coalition recognized the need to leave behind enough warriors to protect their homelands from potential attacks. They had to strike a balance between assembling a formidable army and ensuring the safety of their territories. Despite the need to safeguard their lands, the Pan-Gallic army that gathered for this campaign against Rome was the largest ever seen. It consisted of over 20,000 cavalry and 50,000 infantry, making it a formidable force. This vast army was a testament to the determination and strength of the Gallic tribes and their ambition to challenge the expanding power of the Roman Republic. The sheer size of the army demonstrated the unity and coordination among the Gallic tribes in their shared goal of confronting Rome. It showcased their commitment to the cause and their willingness to mobilize a substantial force to achieve their objectives. The Gallic warriors, renowned for their fierce fighting skills, were ready to unleash their might upon Rome and defend their territories against any Roman incursions. 
This gathering of Gallic tribes and their massive army symbolized a critical moment in the conflict between the Gauls and Rome. It represented a significant challenge to Roman dominance in the region and illustrated the Gauls' determination to resist further Roman expansion into Gallia Cisalpina. The stage was set for a monumental clash between the Gallic coalition and the Roman Republic, which would shape the course of history in the region. I can smell our enemies from here, men. Fear does that to barbarians. Fear and strong drink. They would not stand to fight unless their bellies were swollen with booze. We will empty them presently. Make ready. Recognizing the gravity of the Gallic threat, the Romans took significant measures to counter it. In 229 BCE, they resorted to a drastic act, the first recorded instance of human sacrifice in their history. As advised by an oracle found in the Sibylline books, the Romans buried alive a Gallic man and woman along with a Greek man and woman in the Forum Boreum, or cattle market. They believed this sacrifice would prevent the Gauls and Greeks from occupying the city of Rome. This extreme action demonstrated the Romans' willingness to go to great lengths to protect their territory and maintain their control. Furthermore, the Romans sought to secure their position by forming alliances and setting boundaries. They forged a treaty with Hasdrubal, the Carthaginian commander in Spain, which established the Ebro River as the boundary between their respective spheres of influence. This agreement aimed to ensure that the Carthaginians would not support the Gallic coalition against Rome. The Romans were also successful in finding allies among the Gallic tribes themselves. The Veneti and the Cenomani, two Gallic tribes from the northeastern region of Italy, sided with the Romans. This alliance provided the Romans with additional support and further weakened the Gallic coalition's position. In 225 BCE, the Romans took decisive action by mobilizing five separate armies to confront the Gallic threat. The two consuls for the year, Emilius Papus and Attilius Regulus, were each entrusted with an army consisting of 50,800 infantry and 3,200 cavalry. These forces comprised four legions of Roman citizens, along with 30,000 allied infantry and 2,000 allied cavalry. Emilius Papus was dispatched to Ariminum, located on the Adriatic coast, under the assumption that the Gauls would invade east of the Apennines. Attilius Regulus, on the other hand, was sent to Sardinia, potentially to suppress a rebellion on the island. To guard the western side of the Apennines, an army of 50,000 infantry and 4,000 cavalry was assembled. This force was composed of Etruscans and Sabines, many of whom were now under Roman rule. An unnamed praetor led this army, stationed on the frontiers of Etruria. Additionally, a combined force of allied Italians and Gauls was stationed near the borders of Boy Land, likely to the north of Emilius. Lastly, a reserve army of 20,000 Roman citizen infantry and 1,500 cavalry, along with 30,000 allied infantry and 2,000 allied cavalry, was stationed in Rome. These military deployments showcased the Roman strategic planning and their determination to repel the Gallic threat. By distributing their forces strategically and establishing strong defensive positions, the Romans aimed to counter the Pan-Gallic army and protect their territories from invasion. Unlike two centuries ago when Rome was sacked by the Gauls, Rome was no longer a mere city-state but a republic that had laid the foundation of an empire. After consolidating its hold on peninsular Italy, Rome emerged victorious in the First Punic War and established itself as a major power in the Mediterranean. Tempered in battle with a myriad of nations, the Roman army had become bigger and better. The Gauls entered Etruria through a path in the northern Apennines mountains, encountering little resistance as they made their way towards Rome, plundering along the route. However, their scouts brought news that a large Roman army from Etruria was approaching, and the Gauls found themselves within three days' march of the city. As both armies settled into their camps for the night, 
the Gauls deliberated on their next move. Realizing the size of the Roman army, the Gauls devised a cunning plan. During the night, the Gallic infantry secretly departed towards the nearby town of Fesuli, while the cavalry remained at the campfires. In the morning, the Romans, unaware of the Gallic infantry's whereabouts, assumed they had fled and advanced towards the Gallic cavalry, which promptly fled towards Fesuli. The Romans pursued the cavalry, only to be ambushed by the Gallic infantry attacking from the woods and shrubs near Fesuli. The Gallic cavalry then circled back, trapping the Romans between the infantry and cavalry. Though the Romans found themselves in a precarious situation, their discipline and training proved crucial. The legions and their allies executed a fighting retreat, suffering a loss of 6,000 soldiers but managing to reach a defensible position on a nearby hill. There, they successfully defended against the exhausted Gauls, who had slept little the previous night and were further drained by fighting uphill. Unable to dislodge the Romans, the Gauls retreated to recuperate, leaving a contingent of cavalry to monitor the Romans. In the meantime, Consul Lucius Aemilius Papus, in command of the Roman army on the Adriatic, received word of the Gallic incursion. He swiftly led his troops on a forced march over the Apennines, arriving shortly after the battle at Fesuli. Setting up camp as night fell, Papus's arrival bolstered the morale of the Romans on the hill and posed a significant problem for the Gauls. With their plundered spoils of slaves, cattle, and other loot, King Anarests of the Giseti deemed it wise to return to their homelands and deal with the Romans at a later time. Thus, under cover of darkness, the Gallic army slipped away once again. Blocked by the Romans to the north and wooded hills to the east and west, the Gauls headed southward. The following day, the two Roman armies joined forces and pursued the retreating Gauls. As the terrain opened up near Lake Bolsena, the Gauls veered westward towards the Etrurian coast. From there, they turned back north, aiming to reach the river Pa and their homelands. The Roman army, burdened with its own supply train, draft animals, livestock, and accompanying personnel, followed in the wake of the Gallic army's movements. At this stage, the third Roman army under the command of consul Gaius Attilius Regulus had arrived from Sardinia, sailing north and landing at Pisi on the mainland, likely realizing that the Gauls were no longer a direct threat to Rome but instead focused on escaping with their captives and plunder to their homelands. Regulus, understanding the situation, decided to march south in an attempt to intercept the Gauls and cut off their retreat. To gather crucial intelligence, a reconnaissance party of Romans was sent ahead, and they successfully captured Gallic scouts. These scouts were compelled to reveal the current position of the Gallic army. Regulus received this information and saw an opportunity to annihilate the Gauls, as they would be trapped and squeezed between two Roman armies. He swiftly issued orders for his tribunes to advance in a formation ready for battle, intending to confront the Gauls and deliver a decisive blow. As the Roman and Gallic armies converged near Cape Telamon, a gentle hill loomed beside the road, its strategic significance apparent to both sides. Consul Gaius Attilius Regulus, fueled by a sense of urgency, personally led his cavalry towards the coveted vantage point, hoping to secure it before the Gauls could claim it for themselves. Unbeknownst to the Gauls, a new threat from the north had emerged, catching them off guard. The Gallic army, unaware of the approaching Roman cavalry from the north, observed the determined movement of the Roman riders towards the hill. Mistakenly believing that they were being outflanked by the cavalry of Consul Lucius Aemilius Papus, who they thought was coming from behind, the Gauls swiftly dispatched their own cavalry and light skirmishers to seize the hill. A fierce clash ensued as the Gauls and Romans vied for control of the hill. The Gallic cavalry, driven by their initial misconception, fought valiantly, seeking to secure the advantageous position. They managed to take some Roman prisoners during the intense skirmish, which momentarily bolstered their spirits. However, the captured Romans revealed the grim reality to their captors, 
two colossal Roman force was closing in on them from two directions, effectively encircling the Gauls. As the Roman armies under consuls Gaius Attilius Regulus and Lucius Aemilius Papus closed in on the Gauls, the battlefield became a chaotic tapestry of shifting alliances and formations. The boy and Taurisi, aware of Regulus' approaching army, formed their ranks to confront the Roman forces advancing from the front. On the other side, the Giseti and Insubras pivoted their positions to face Papu's army closing in from behind. The Gallic chariots and wagons took their places on the flanks, ready to unleash havoc upon the enemy lines. In a strategic move, a small detachment of Gauls was entrusted with guarding the captured booty on the neighboring hills, ensuring its safety during the impending clash. Atop the roadside hill, the clash of cavalry erupted in a frenzy of violence. It was a swirling maelstrom of horsemen, swords clashing, and spears thrusting. Consul Regulus, leading the charge, fought with valor and determination. However, fate dealt a cruel blow as he was struck by a mortal blow, his lifeblood staining the ground beneath him. The grim trophy of his severed head was swiftly seized by the Gauls and carried back to their kings, a macabre symbol of their triumph. But the Gauls had little time to revel in their momentary victory. Before they could fully grasp the gravity of their actions, the thunderous arrival of Consul Papu's army disrupted the jubilation. Papu swiftly organized his legions, forming a formidable line to confront the Gauls head-on. Recognizing the dire situation on the hill, Papus dispatched his cavalry to reinforce the embattled Roman horsemen, adding a fresh surge of strength to their ranks. The clash between the Roman legions and the Gallic warriors erupted in a frenzy of bloodshed and chaos. The Roman infantry, although not professional soldiers, were disciplined and well-trained, while the Gallic warriors fought with wild abandon their fierce appearance striking fear into the hearts of their opponents. As the battle commenced, the Roman consuls strategically deployed their light troops to harass and disrupt the Gauls. Dressed in animal skins and armed with small round shields, these agile fighters unleashed a barrage of javelins upon the front ranks of the Gallic warriors. The Roman missiles found their mark, piercing through the air and finding gaps in the Gallic defenses. The Gauls, lacking the range to effectively retaliate, took cover behind their large shields, crouching low to minimize the impact of the deadly Roman projectiles. The naked Giseti, known for their daring and connection to nature, braved the onslaught but became easy targets for the Roman javelins. Before they could close in on their foes, the Giseti were impaled, their bodies falling to the ground in a futile display of courage. Amidst the blaring of trumpets and the thunderous tramp of legionaries, the Roman maniples advanced, their determination unwavering. The Hastati, forming the first line, unleashed another volley of javelins upon the Gauls. The barbed iron heads of the heavy pilum javelins embedded themselves in the Gallic shields, rendering them cumbersome and difficult to wield. While the Gauls struggled to dislodge the javelins, the Hastati seized the opportunity, drawing their short swords and charging forward with relentless ferocity. The clash between the Gauls and the Romans intensified, each side wielding their weapons with deadly intent. The Gauls swung their powerful swords, their mighty arcs aimed at splintering shields and piercing through the bronze helmets of their Roman adversaries. Their red hair flowing and their painted shields swirling, they fought like untamed fury of wolves, unleashing their primal instincts on the battlefield. The Roman legionaries, on the other hand, armed with short swords, stood firm in their tightly packed formation. Their disciplined shield wall presented a formidable barrier, allowing them to weather the storm of Gallic attacks. The oblong scutum, bent backward to enclose part of the bearer's body, provided an additional layer of protection for the Romans. Beneath their shields, the exposed legs of the Roman soldiers were safeguarded by greaves, 
offering defense against the slashing strikes of Gallic swords. As the battle raged on, the clash of steel reverberated through the air. Gauls and Romans locked in a deadly dance, each side desperately seeking an advantage over the other. The Gauls, renowned for their physical strength and wild courage, aimed to break through the Roman shield wall with their relentless onslaught. Yet, the Romans, disciplined and well-equipped, fought with strategic precision. The Hastati, adorned with breastplates, stood as the first line of defense, their short swords stabbing with deadly accuracy. Behind them, the Principes and Triarii, wearing chainmail for added protection, awaited their turn to engage the Gauls. The battlefield became a chaotic tableau of clashing weapons, cries of pain, and shouts of determination. The Gauls, their bloodlust driving them forward, sought to overpower the Romans with their sheer force and individualistic fighting style. The Romans, however, stood united, their shield wall unyielding, their discipline strikes finding their mark. In the midst of the chaos, individual acts of bravery and heroism played out. Gauls swung their swords with devastating strength, their blows shattering shields and finding gaps in the Roman defenses. Roman legionaries, with unwavering resolve, countered with precise thrusts and well-timed strikes, their short swords piercing through the armor of their Gallic foes. The battle ebbed and flowed, the tide of advantage shifting between the two forces. The Gauls, driven by their fierce determination, fought with a primal fury, while the Romans, bolstered by their training and equipment, fought with calculated efficiency. But as the battle wore on, the Roman discipline and superior armor began to tip the scales in their favor. The Gallic warriors, exhausted and gradually losing their cohesion, struggled to match the relentless pressure exerted by the Roman legions. The weight of the Roman assault proved too much for the Gauls to bear. Their ranks thinned, their bodies battered and bruised, they fought on, fueled by pride and a love for their homeland. Yet, the disciplined and organized Roman war machine pressed forward, each soldier playing their part in the greater strategy. Amidst the chaos and carnage of the battlefield, the Gauls fought with unwavering resolve, their skill and brute force on full display. Outnumbered and surrounded, they stood their ground, pushing back against the relentless onslaught of the Roman legions. With each clash of swords and clash of shields, they fiercely defended their position, unwilling to yield an inch. For a fleeting moment, hope flickered in the hearts of the Gauls, as the tide of battle seemed to sway in their favor. Their warriors, fueled by a burning desire to protect their people and their way of life, unleashed a ferocity that could rival even the most savage of beasts. Yet, the odds were stacked against them, and the Romans were relentless in their pursuit of victory. Up on the hill, the thunderous clash of hooves had already heralded the triumph of the Roman cavalry. With their foes vanquished, the Roman horsemen descended upon the plain. Like a torrent of fury, they charged into the midst of the Gallic infantry, their spears piercing through the air and finding their mark with deadly precision. The Gauls, hemmed in from all sides, found themselves trapped in a maelstrom of destruction. Panic surged through their ranks, and desperation gripped their hearts. Despite their valiant efforts, they could not withstand the overwhelming force and tactical prowess of the Roman army. The battlefield became a macabre scene of chaos and bloodshed, as the Romans pressed their advantage and cut down the Gauls with ruthless efficiency. The cries of victory mingled with the anguished wails of the fallen, echoing across the scarred landscape. The battle was nearing its devastating end, and the once proud Gauls, who had fought with such fierce determination, now lay broken and defeated. Their valiant struggle had come to a tragic conclusion, as the might of the Roman legions proved too formidable to overcome. In the aftermath of the battle, the ground was littered with the fallen warriors of both sides, a testament to the price paid in the pursuit of glory and the defense of one's homeland. The Gauls had fought like wolves, their ferocity unmatched, but ultimately, they had succumbed to the relentless force and strategic brilliance of the Roman war machine.
Following the battle at Telema, the Gauls suffered heavy losses, with 40,000 warriors losing their lives and another 10,000 being captured and destined for the slave markets. Among the captives was King Concolatanus, while King Anarests managed to escape but tragically took his own life overcome by grief. In an act of restitution, Consul Papus sent the Gallic plunder back to Rome, intending to return it to its rightful owners. He then led his army on a campaign of vengeance, wreaking havoc by burning and killing as they marched towards the lands of the boy. The subsequent campaigns that unfolded after the battle at Telamon witnessed the Romans relentlessly dismantling Gallic resistance in northern Italy. A significant turning point came with the Roman victory at Clastidium in 222 BCE, which compelled most of the Gauls to submit to Roman rule. However, Gallic defiance rekindled during Hannibal's invasion of Italy and persisted for a decade following the conclusion of the Second Punic War. It was not until 191 BCE that the boy, the last stronghold of Gallic resistance, finally surrendered. Refusing to accept Roman dominion, the boy embarked on a migratory path that led them to the Danube region, where their name would eventually become associated with Bohemia. During this period, Roman influence continued to expand throughout Gallia Cisalpina, marked by the construction of Roman roads and the establishment of colonies. By the mid-2nd century BCE, the region had undergone significant Italianization, with the Gauls gradually adopting Roman customs and culture.